Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbour Lab and BioArchive. With me I have Nick Pridefoot from the University of Oxford. Nick, welcome to Cold Spring Harbour. It's great to be here. It always is. I, I come back to Cold Spring Harbour remarkably frequently and uh, I always enjoy it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's very nice to have you back. Um, and as we were as just discussing, it's, it's interesting because it turns out that, that many years ago you were an examiner of mine as an undergraduate, so um, in s so the, the tables are now turned, but I, 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 I promise it won't be as painful. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Well, I don't think you had a lot of pain. I think Oxford students in general were pampers and yes, well looked yeah. after. Yeah, we, we, we certainly were. <laughs> Good. But um, here at Cospring Harbour, we're here for the um, symposium on mm -hmm. uh, RNA control and regulation. And you're right, going right. to be talking later in the week about... Tomorrow, in fact. Tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow morning. I think tomorrow morning. I okay. Believe, yes. Well, Friday you can morning. think of this as, as light <laughs> preparation. Light preparation. I haven't haven't quite decided which slides to throw out of my talk yet. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we can investigate that. <laughs> Although it's pretty amazing how, how some of some of my colleagues do manage to put a lot of stuff into these talks because the, the benefit, of course, is that the, the audience is, is is very knowledgeable. The the, mm -hmm. the problem with giving any lectures is always that you have a spectrum of knowledge, and so really you ought to give the lecture to the people with the least knowledge, which means you. Can't say a whole lot because you know you've got to start from the <laughs> basics. <laughs> well, you're talking to somebody with with very little knowledge now, but um, you'll be talking about uh, long non-coding RNAs. Mm -hmm. So, can you remind us all what these are? There's not protein coding, and there's a bunch of classes. What are we talking about? Well, um, of course, the concept of the gene is that the gene makes a protein, and so the 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 the, the critical genes in mammalian, mammalian genomes would be protein coding genes and obviously it was appreciated there were lots of other transcription units that made structural RNAs like ribosomal RNA or tRNA and these are actually made by different RNA polymerases but the RNA polymerase 2 which makes the protein coding genes lo and behold it's transpired that it does a lot of other transcription that doesn't seem to be directly related to producing a messenger RNA and, and then a protein and in a way, we should have known that this was the case because when mammalian protein coding genes were first really picked apart, it was clear that a large fraction of the, of the gene is actually non-coding, it's intronic. And so you get extraordinary situations where 90% or even 95% of the transcription unit is actually intronic and is removed by splicing and then largely degraded. But these are separate transcription but, but then, units. But, so, so, these, so these would all be protein coding gene transcription units. But, but then, of course, the realization that there were a whole bunch of transcription units that didn't have any pretense about making a protein. They're entirely non-coding. Um, these guys appeared, particularly when um, genomic or transcriptomic analysis became possible and you could really get a more complete and higher resolution profile of transcription across, across the genome. And Initially, these non-coding RNAs were discovered, and of course, the, the simplest interpretation of, of the discovery is that if these RNAs exist, they must, they must be there for, they're there for a purpose, and so let's go and find out what the purpose is. But of course, the problem with these non-coding RNAs is that in general, they're very unstable, they're rapidly degraded, so the cell doesn't usually take a lot of care of producing very much of them. And these are distinct from the microRNAs? That well, the microRNAs about. are really fragments of RNA which mm -hmm. come out of other transcription units. Most microRNAs actually come out of these large introns in protein coding genes. About, I think we estimate about 70 to 80 percent of, mm -hmm. of microRNAs come out of the introns of protein coding genes. But there are some non-coding RNAs which also are, are host transcripts to microRNAs. Right. Oh, I see. And and you you mentioned in the introns, but you know you you see these in the introns, promoter regions, enhancers, well, the between genes. MicroRNAs. MicroRNAs have been found pretty much. No, I mean the long. The long oh, the long non-coding. Uh, okay, so so you get this class of long non-coding RNAs, which are clearly not encoding for any protein sequence. So there's a bit of a debate about that. They might make they might encode a little tiny peptide, perhaps. Uh -huh. But but, uh, but I, I think I think the evidence for that is in general rather limited. But no, they, it, what's, what's apparent about many long non-coding RNAs is, is that really they're, they're almost made by accident by the, by the protein coding genes. Because when RNA polymerase 2 initiates transcription on a promoter, as well as going in the forward direction to make the, the, the pre-messenger RNA, it can also go backwards to make a long non-coding RNA. So this is what, so when you're, you're starting in a tartar box or whatever, yeah, it, it, you it, shoot it, off in the wrong it, direction it, it, as well? It, but basically, basically it seems that RNA polymerase 2 is, in, is a fairly naive enzyme complex, it'll just bind to anywhere which is accessible, which is uh -huh. a, nucle a nucleosome-free region, and then it'll just go in either direction. 
Right. And, uh, and it's pretty much the case that, I don't know, the vast majority of protein code aging promoters are bidirectional in terms right. of their make So you're getting an antisense transcript. Well, it's, it's not antisense to that because it initiates outside the transcription unit right. of the protein code aging, but goes into, the, into the five prime flanking region, essentially. Uh -huh. So, so you get that type of, of, of non coding RNA, but then of course promoters for protein coding genes are, are often controlled by enhancers. In mm -hmm. fact, most protein coding genes will be regulated by a bunch of, uh, of, of really distant promoter elements. You can really regard enhancers as being sort of separate promoter elements, but which come together in 3D by some sort of chromosome looping to form the actual promoter hub. And lo and behold, enhancers also generate transcripts directly themselves. And, and, and because, because, again, enhancers uh, are regions of chromatin which are open, are only pretty much you can get in there, and it can go in either direction. So that's the common, with all these things, that's the common feature. It's, you've got some open chromatin. That's right. In and, so, and, and, so, and so the antisense promoter transcripts and the enhancer um, transcripts, and these are all long, long coding RNAs, um, these, these probably, in most cell types, will, will account for well over 50%, if not 75% of the long, long coding RNAs. Because, because there are loads of enhancers. I mean, enhancers mm -hmm. are, right. very, are very numerous, and they're all generating transcripts, in, usually in both directions. And so the, the enhancer and the promoter, when they're, I mean, you, you know, you, we, we talk about junk DNA, you know, is there such a thing as junk RNA, or are these sort of serendipitously generated things that actually have a Well, a I think, role? I think, I think, I think, Initially, you can regard them as junk, but, but, but of course they're greatly beneficial to evolution because sometimes these transcripts, although they're not used in a particular evolutionary stage, they, they, may, they may acquire a function which then makes them very valuable to the regulation right. of, of, uh, of gene expression in a cell. So a classic example is a, a long non-coding RNA called NORAD, which probably began its life as a non-functional transcript, but it happened to have a bunch of binding sites for this very interesting protein called Pumilo. Uh -huh. and, 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 and I guess evolution then increased the number of Pumilo binding sites, so it, so it has a whole bunch of them. And so it ends up being a sponge which regulates the levels of Pumilio in the cell. And Pumilio is very important in development and in, 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 uh, indirectly with DNA damage and other, other important issues for cells to cope with. So many of these will just be sort of sitting around as a, as a kind sort of, of sort of Sort of analogous to introns. Introns are mainly functionalist, but mm -hmm. evolution has put some, some introns to good use in terms of you can get microRNAs out of them, you can get also there are other small RNAs that are chopped out of introns like snow RNAs. But then of course the benefit of having introns, or, or rather having genes cut up into exons, is that you can have different combinations of exons to give you different proteins, and so you get, or you, you yeah. get a greatly increased proteome through, through the presence of introns. And, you have this and sort the, of yeah. combinatorial... And so maybe long non-coding yeah. RNAs are also providing potential evolutionary advantage. You certainly see more long non-coding RNAs the higher the, the kind of the complexity of the, of, of the eukaryote. So you see you see some long non coding RNAs in, in a CI, but as you go as you go up into mammals, you see a lot more. You see, more. oh, I see. I see. And, and then there are indeed some long non coding RNAs which don't seem to be directly connected to a uh, to, to an adjacent protein coding gene, uh, and these are often referred to as long intergenic non coding so RNAs. So these are the link RNAs. Yeah, these are the link RNAs, and they're really the same thing as eRNAs and promoter antisense RNAs. Um, in terms of the fact they probably don't code for any proteins, and some of them may or may not have a function. Some of them may just be, may just be for some reason a patch of chromatin in in an intergenic region becomes open for some unknown reason, and then it it, it, it becomes a prom potentially so, a promoter. So there aren't the kinds. So I mean, when we think of mRNA, there's a specific set of signals in the DNA that it, that, that initiates transcription. And um, what's happening with these? It's just it's just open. Well. Um, some of them may have evolved uh, binding sites for initiation transcription factors mm -hmm. and, uh, and may become more like bona fide sort of protein coding promoters. But um, what, what my lab has come up with, and which I'll be talking about tomorrow, is, is another trick which we think is important for the generation of a lot of long non coding RNAs, which is that um, w when transcripts are made by any polymerase, one of the things that the transcripts can do is to actually re anneal back to the DNA template. So, so as the polymerase initiates transcription, from a promoter, the first thing it does to the DNA template that is transcribing is to actually unwind it a bit. So it's, right. so it's like a strand invasion yeah. type of thing. And so, and so because, 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 the, because the DNA is partly underwound, negatively mm -hmm. supercoiled, and because of course the polymerases in order to transcribe genes have to expand the nucleosome free zone as they transcribe through the gene, then you have a, a nascent RNA coming out from behind the polymerase, which is just lying in wait to 
interact to with any back in, yeah, to, to get back in. So and indeed, it does get back in. I, I suspect that virtually all transcription will form these RNA DNA hybrids, displacing mm -hmm. one of the DNA strands in the duplex a lot of the time. Um, but, but as soon as you form this RNA DNA hybrid with a single strand DNA, and this structure is called an R loop, by the way, that's right. the jargon. And so the point about the R loop is that because, because you displace one of the DNA strands in the double helix into single strand form, the single strand DNA is, 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 is prone to damage. And so R loops are damage inducing. Right. And so the cell has evolved lots of mechanisms to get rid of these awkward structures, these R loops. And so, and so there are lots of helicases which unzip the RNA DNA hybrid. Uh -huh. and, 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 and so, so if, if you look at the steady state profile of R loops across the genome, you see plenty of them, but they're probably where, for whatever reason, the formation has outcompeted. And the this removal. R loops then, what that's serving as a promoter well, for? Well, once, once we knew R loops were particularly, they're, they're particularly associated with the beginnings of the transcription units and also quite often at the ends of the transcription units. Mm -hmm. In fact, where the original nucleosome free zones tend to be in genes. And um, it occurred to me some years ago that, that actually when you form an R loop, because you have this displaced DNA strand, that that's actually the exact template you need to initiate transcription. I mean, well, when you initiate transcription, what the initiation factors are doing is trying to pull apart the DNA strands so that RNA polymerase can get into the template strand and, and, and start copying uh -huh. it. And so, of course, the R loops form the single strand DNA straight off um, by forming the hybrid on the other strand. And so that's now a potential template for initiation of transcription, just by itself. It's just, it's, the, the polymerase will go to any open region of chromatin. Right. It'll, right. It'll, even, it, it'll greatly prefer to go to single strand DNA. That, that's exactly what mm -hmm. it needs to start transcribing. So what we've shown in vitro is that actually RNA polymerase does indeed um, bind to these R loops and actually transcribes the strand which was displaced, which means it's making an antisense transcript to the normal sense transcript. Right. Which, of course, is the exact orientation of most of these, or many of these, long non-coding RNAs. They tend to be antisense to the protein coding gene. Right. And so we showed this happens in vitro. We, we, we artificially made a plasmid with an R loop in the middle of it. We stuck it into a nuclear extract, and lo and behold, um, we generate a transcript that you can see initiates in the single-strand region of the R loop. So clearly, RNA polymerase 2 in a nuclear extract is perfectly happy to transcribe what's the, this plasmid. What does the frequency look like for those, and what would you imagine in vivo? Um, well, of course, the issue was we could see this in vitro, but is this all a big artifact of a test mm -hmm. tube experiment? So we've spent a lot of time trying to prove this happens in vivo, and, and, and we think we have proven this. How do you do that? Well, it, the trouble is it's kind of indirect. You have to, you have to show that a transcript, a long non-coding RNA, really is dependent on an R loop, and the simplest way to do that is to overexpress this enzyme which gets rid of the RNA-DNA hybrid, RNAs H. Right. So if you overexpress RNAs H, you can then show that not only do you get rid of R loops, but furthermore you lose a whole set of these long non-coding RNAs, particularly the ones that come from the promoters backwards, but also the enhancers. Right. They also have they also form R loops, the, the, the enhancer transcripts, and, and you can see that if you overexpress RNAs H, a lot of the ERNAs, the e, the, the enhancer derived LNC RNAs disappear. Right. So we so I, I think that quite a high fraction of the non-coding transcriptome might well derive from this type of R loop promoter activity. So do you, is, there, is there a regulatory role of these transcripts? Presumably as the, as the mRNA is being synthesized, there, is there then, you know, I mean, it can go in one direction, it can re anneal or, you know, there, there's the co-transcriptional processing proteins coming on. Is there some... Is there some regulation? I, I mean, the, the clearly are specific cases where this is likely to be regulated, but um, to my knowledge so far, we have no direct evidence for the regulated formation of R loops so that they can initiate transcription in uh -huh. a backwards direction. I think it's more, it smells more like sort of a, a sort of a, a genome accident, if you like. But, but uh -huh. I, mean, I mean, transcription is dangerous, basically. If, if you make a yeah. transcript, you're, you're exposing the DNA to, to damage, you're, and you're, you're exposing it to the formation of these R loop structures. Yeah. And, and, and then, lo and behold, you generate all these extra transcripts. And, and what we've also shown in my lab is that these, 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 most of these long long coding RNAs initiate, or many of them initiate, from this R loop promoter um, mechanism. But then the cell has evolved a way to, to stop them going too far. So there's a, there's a complex um, called the integrator complex, which is associated with promoters and enhancers. Mm -hmm. and, and it appears to have a sort of a 3 prime n forming activity. And so a lot of long long coding RNAs tend to be fairly sort of rapidly curtailed. Although they're called long, they tend not to be more than 
several hundred nucleotides. So they're just long relative to they're like long, 23 nucleotides. They're right? long relative to microRNAs, right. but they're still quite short exactly. relative to a pre-messenger RNA. Right. Oh, um, but what we showed was that if you, if, if you mess around with the balance of transcription, we showed really quite serendipitously that if you get rid of a, a POL2 elongation factor called SPT6, which, which is well known to be important for um, transcriptional initiation across long genes in particular, but if, if you knock it out, then actually what happens is the the regular protein coding gene transcripts don't work quite so well, but then lo and behold, the antisense long non coding RNAs start working much better. Right. And furthermore, they not only work much better, you get more of them, but they go much, much further. And then we show that actually not having SPT6 causes a, a loss of recruitment of integrating. And so, so, so and the phenotype of, of the cells that, that don't have SPT6 and so make a lot more of these long non coding RNAs. Is, is, is very bad news. The, the cell cycle grinds to a halt, the cells go into senescence. Um, we show there's loads of R loops now being formed by these extended long non coding RNAs. Lots of DNA damage. <laughs> so, would you, I mean, that it seems like there's obviously this, you know, like you said, it's a risky business transcription. Opening up your DNA is a risky business. Yeah. There's different phases during development. Would you expect to see more of these at different times in development? And do you have to have additional mechanisms to cope with well, this? Uh, well, what, what I should immediately qualify what I've told you um, so far is, is that all of our experiments are based on an easy experimental system, which is the hideous HeLa cell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and HeLa cells are great because they grow really fast, they're very easy to manipulate. And with CRISPR you can do pretty much anything with the HeLa cell. It sort of grows like a yeast, but it's sort of a mammalian cell type. But of course it's very mutated and very weird. Right. And so it would be much better, or it would be nice in the future to do experiments to look at these sorts of um, transcript uh, mechanisms in, in, in a primary cell or maybe in a stem cell. I would guess in stem cells where there's a lot more open That's what chromatin, I was thinking. then you might expect to see more potential um, for forming non-coding RNAs. Maybe some of these are more, more likely to be functional. I, I don't know. I mean, the truth is that these experiments end up being very, very expensive. Yeah, so you have, you have to make a lot of libraries. We've made probably two or three hundred transcriptomic libraries from HeLa cells so far. So we, so we know an enormous amount. And so to, to, to get that amount of data in, in, a, in a stem cell would, would involve a lot of work. And, and yeah. we, we haven't yet embarked on it, although we probably should. <laughs> so is that, is that the, next, the next step? Um, I would like to do some of these experiments in, in, in primary cells or, in, 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 or at least cells which are uh, slightly less weird than HeLa cells. I mean, HeLa yeah. cells, because they've been cultured for so, so many generations, they, they've acquired lots of uh, polyploidal sort of chromosomal mm -hmm. regions, and, 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 and essentially, HeLa cells have, have, uh, seem to have evolved in culture to cope with the fact that they're loaded with DNA damage, so they have a yeah. lot of damage factors upregulated, which is interesting if you want to study DNA damage, but, it, yeah. but it's clearly aberrant to some extent. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that, um, you know, looking through evolution, different organisms have different amounts of these. Are you looking in other well, species? Well, when, when I say that, I maybe should qualify that. I mean, re the point about different, the point about sort of simpler organisms like Cerevisiae is the genome is just much smaller. And so there isn't, there isn't much space to make a separate transcript between the protein coding genes because one leads to the other very quickly. Right. So but, but, but you can still get antisense transcripts across protein Yeah. Um, so it's about gene code. density rather than It may be about, but I, I, sus I suspect also sort of unicellular organisms find it harder to energetically afford to make all these weird transcripts that aren't, aren't doing anything. And so getting rid of them yeah. is, a, is probably beneficial. Well, whilst e energy is never a very serious issue for, 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 a, for a mammalian cell, because obviously in an animal, you have homeostasis, you, you, you guarantee mm -hmm. a concentration of ATP. And so you can make a whole lot of transcripts that may be beneficial in terms of evolution, but are not particularly useful to the, the animal yeah. at that point in time. At least that's my, that's my take on it. <laughs> you said I should do all the talking. I'm afraid right. I am doing all the talking. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and it, it, it's, been, it's been great talking with you. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's nice to know that energetic um, considerations are not that important once you yeah, I get... Mean, I mean, yeah, we, we, all, we all expect to have breakfast, lunch and dinner, don't we? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. But if you're a poor yeast, you've got no idea. You made a sort of float into distilled water and then, you know, deep yeah. trouble. Yes, <laughs> eat, 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 eat whenever you can. Um, yeah. Uh, well, well, it's been fascinating talking with you. Thanks very much, Nick. It's a pleasure. <laughs>